sandwiched between two famous kings, his father John and his son Edward. He is the forgotten ruler of the 13th century. His reign was long and not beaten until George III. So, follow me as we explore the tumultuous reign of Henry III. Let's get stuck in. Anno 1231. And once again, the Kingdom of England is looking for a new Archbishop of Canterbury. Richard Ligrant had died in Italy following his feud with the Judicia, Hubert de Burr. The acquisition of the lands of the seven-year-old Richard de Clare being the last straw for the clergyman. Alas, another one of Hubert's enemies has fallen. Although there can be no accusations of conspiracy here, Archbishop Grant fell ill in a foreign land, far from de Burr, a mere bad twist of fate and Grant was buried in Italy, where he remains to this day. Lord Chancellor Ralph Neville did get elected to the position of Archbishop of Canterbury, but still needed the Pope's approval, and the Pope shot it down in flames, so the position remained unfilled. And now, only de Blondeville was left to truly oppose the powerful and ambitious Justicia, Hubert de Burr. William the Younger Marshal also passed away due to apparent overindulgence. Oh woe, Henry is said to have cried. Is the blood of Thomas the Martyr not avenged yet? This left the next marshal as Richard, who was a French vassal living in Normandy. Yet Henry was getting disillusioned with Hubert de Burr, making a complete pig's ear of the Welsh border he was supposed to be controlling. The king needed a marshal, like William of old. But Richard needed convincing he'd receive safe passage before he'd make the trip to England. But another opponent of Hubert de Burr, familiar to us, also crops up again around this time. Peter de Roche, a bishop of Winchester. He'd helped considerably with the situation on the continent, negotiating with the French on behalf of King Henry. He, along with de Blondeville, had secured a truce with Blanche de Castile, and the bishop had many exploits during his years away, including helping patch up the tensions between the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick, and the Pope. Even though in self-exile, de Roche's loyalty to the throne of England was without question. He's just another of de Burr's defeated political opponents. And with the crusade concluded, Peter de Roche was back. Heading to the Welsh border, he meets up with the king there, and Henry greeted him as an old friend. You can imagine the scene. As the king had wrapped up the campaign against the Welsh, and was in the process of rebuilding the damaged fortress at Payne's Castle. Apparently, it was quite the muddy scene, and the building work was everywhere. In August, Richard Marshall makes his way from the continent to England and inherits the Earl of Pembroke, along with the Leinster land in Ireland, swearing loyalty to King Henry and abandoning the French. He was now the new Marshal in charge of controlling the Welsh border, and hopefully he'll do a better job than de Burr, which isn't too hard. Talking of inheriting, you then have the young Simon de Montfort, 
He's the same age as the king and has just acquired the Leicester lands he's been demanding. De Montfort has actually met the king before, prior to the French campaign, and around this time he was granted half of the Earl of Leicester. I'll explain that, because in years past the Earldom of Leicester was split between the two sisters of Robert Beaumont, the fourth Earl of Leicester, the elder Simon de Montfort being the fifth, and the young Simon de Montfort, this chap, being the sixth. Robert died about 30 years ago with no heirs, and basically everything went to two sisters. One of the sisters passed her part down to de Montfort, the other sister passed her half down to the Earl of Chester, Ralph de Blonville, which was why Simon de Montfort had sought out de Blonville to get his half, because the king's already granted him the other half. He wants to reunite the estate. But the matter is still dragging on regarding Leicester as Ranulf is being his usual grumbling self. But he's not opposing the young de Montfort, no, he's opposing his nemesis, Hubert de Burr, as the wily old statesman has managed to get his fingers in the Leicester pie, with two grants from the king. Why are we not surprised? This is what de Blonville opposes. Now this is a bit of a problem, because de Montfort has taken out a loan of £700 for a buyback. He's basically brought the other half of the state, and it only generates £500 a year. It would be worth a lot more if the whole of Leicester was united. He, he needs the bits that de Burr has. Yes, £500 is still a lot of money. But de Montfort's now in the big league, no longer a mere knight. All the others are generating thousands of pounds. So quite a lot of politicking was going behind the scenes of the royal court, and adding to this was the situation in Wales. Llewellyn was Ranulph's friend. The conflict was no good for anyone, and all because de Burr wanted a cheap land grab. All this results in Ranulf de Blonville storming out of the court in anger, taking de Montfort with him. Henry didn't want yet another squabble, so he granted the lands back to Leicester. Increasingly, the fog was lifting from the king's eyes. Hubert de Burr was a menace. And Hubert must have seen this, as the cards that were once stacked in his favour were now dealing him a bad hand. De Blondeville was just the ringleader. Now Peter de Roche was back, Richard de Cornwall, Richard Marshall, and now Simon de Montfort. The grumblers were growing. I'll just mention briefly that now de Montfort has Leicester. One of the first things he does in 1231 was expel all of the Jews out of the domain. And both his parents were hostile towards Jews and de Montfort was no exception. And so expelled they were on the orders never to return. As for the king, he's more intent on marriage. He's in his mid-twenties more or less and still has no bride and not for the lack of trying. It really seems to be getting to Henry, and his emotional state is worsening. The problem is, he's either too picky, or prefers women with ties to Blondrica still, and he relies on de Burr finding the suitors, and he's busy trolling the Scottish courts for a princess. After all, there's Marjorie, the sister of Alexandra of Scotland. Sure, she's 30 and still unmarried, but well, that's neither here nor there, according to de Burr. Bugger is, there's a catch. The Scots still claim Northumbria, and Alexander won't let Henry marry his sister without it given over. Uh, plus, de Burr is also connected to Marjorie, which is highly controversial at the King's Court. So that's another marriage out of the window. 
spurred by Peter Dru, the Duke of Brittany, who was connected with the Grumblers along with Philip the Albany. More cards stacked against de Burr. Peter of Drew hints that Henry should marry his sister. This is the second time he's attempted it, and it's a flat no. Like I said, Henry is pretty picky. With the return of his old friend and mentor, Peter de Roche, Henry spends that Christmas at Winchester. All previous squabbles, water under the bridge, and boy what a feast it was. You see, Peter de Roche had been bragging about his adventures in the East, and in the courts of the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick. No doubt Henry was wondering if the wily old bishop could live up to his tall tales and his adventures. And he certainly did. Henry must have felt like an emperor of old, as he enjoyed presents of gold and silver, wine flowed freely, and freshly hunted game was feasted upon. Remember, Peter de Roche is Henry's old mentor. These two go way back. They really are old friends, regardless of what de Burr thinks. There was also a bit of carrot and stick going on here. Peter de Roche is adding further divide between the king and Hubert de Burr. The king doesn't have all the riches, but he's told he's only got himself to blame. He gives away territory with ease and doesn't sit on assets before passing them on. There was nothing stopping him from collecting the revenue for children too young to fully inherit their domains. Like de Clare, Henry should have used it. Not giving it straight to de Burr, because now he gets to reap the revenue, and getting more richer in the process. So Henry could see that carrot dangling in front of him. He should have listened to de Roche long ago. The Christmas court at Winchester wasn't all roses either. There was what had been dubbed by Wendover as the Great Excitement. Basically, there had been a spate of kidnappings and murders in the area of Canterbury. All were aimed at the cabal of Italian clerks that had come to collect the controversial tithes for the papacy. I say Italian clerks, yeah. Most hadn't bothered to turn up, so sent proxies instead. Yeah, pretty patronising, to say the least. And a group of bandits, 80 men strong, had decided to do something about it. They were playing Robin Hood, faces hidden under hoods of sackcloth. They robbed from these papal clerks in Canterbury and gave the money back to the poor. Anyone who looked too far into this suffered retribution, like buildings being burned and investigators beaten. The bandits were ruthless. It was best to keep your nose out of their business. And among the clergy, support for these scallywags was growing. With the new year, which is 1232 underway, Henry also intervened in affairs of Oxford University, as well as Cambridge. Yep, they are that old. He wanted to make sure scholars were not overcharged for their accommodation. Outside of the Archbishopric of Canterbury, a band of Robin Hood impersonators and Hubert de Burr being a pain, Henry's only real troubles was the Welsh, namely Llewyn and the Great who was proving a pain in the bum. The Welsh prince was still intent on fighting, despite many deals and treaties over the years. Yet despite Henry's efforts, and even intervention from Peter de Roche, the barons simply didn't want to fight, refusing aid. 
they had completed their military obligation, and that was that. Uh, so for the moment, Llewellyn was left alone. In June, a letter from Pope Gregory arrives. He's not happy about the bandits that roam the countryside of Canterbury. He claims that one of his messengers has been murdered, a second injured and left for dead. He wants this stopped and the perpetrators found and punished. By now, a sheriff's posse had been mobilised to bring the bandits in, ignoring the retribution. Yet, when they finally caught up with the bandits, the cheeky buggers showed the sheriff that they had a warrant from the king, and they let go. So either the sheriff is pretty stupid, because he's literally been hired by the king, or paid off and corrupt. Uh, so Pope Gregory himself gets a group together to get to the bottom of this, uh, given that the English are reluctant to investigate, fearing retribution, or just generally corrupt. But as the papal clerks look into this, it, it was turning out to be more than just a random group of scallywags. Uh, they were pretty well connected. Right, the outfit was put together by a secret society known as Universitas, and they had some powerful connections, including clergy and nobility. The leader of this shadowy organisation was revealed to be a minor knight from Yorkshire called Sir Robert de Twing. You couldn't make it up. Although the nobility having connections to organised crime was actually pretty common and certainly explains the actions of the sheriff. But Robert de Twing had a motive. He'd recently acquired the benefice to a church and the papal clerks simply turned up and took it away without a word. So he was out for revenge. But the run of these bandits would soon be at an end, secret society or not. Those that didn't flee were arrested and punished. Although don't expect gibbets and crows, and no one swung at Tyburn. Most were simply let off. A few unlucky ones saw prison time, but that was that. As for Robert de Twang, he is forced to head to Rome to explain his case to the Pope. After all, this is a church matter. This lonely knight, a Yorkshireman, probably feared the worst as the ship he is held in made its slow journey to the Vatican all the way in Italy. Then, to his utter surprise, Pope Gregory spares the rod. He lets him off. Reform would be a much better option regarding Canterbury going forward. And after all, the lack of an archbishop there was solely Pope Gregory's own fault, as he's the one that denied Ralph Neville on the grounds of being too old and a bit, in his mind, simple, thus barring the chances of fulfilling that position, which is why the position was empty. So that was that. Robert the Twang is let off. He probably had a come to Jesus moment. It's not written, but I can only imagine how he felt. There he is, in the Vatican of all places, and has just survived a wigging from the Pope. He got a slap on the wrist. He's alive and free to head back to England. Now, if I were him, and I'm not deeply religious, even so, I'd head straight for St. Peter's Basilica and pray my heart out uh, before heading to a nice Italian taverna and enjoying some of the best wine in Europe. I'll stay there a good while before heading back to the, uh, the Kingdom of England. 
Oh, when I say the St. Peter's Basilica and not the Sistine Chapel for two reasons. One, it's the one on Vatican Hill, one of the most holy places in Christendom. And two, the Sistine Chapel is not built yet, which narrows it down a bit. Not long after this, there is an incident at the Bronholm Priory in East Anglia on the coast. You see, the Priory held a piece of the true cross, that is, the cross that Christ himself died on. Now, from our modern lens, we can understand that the chances of this relic being genuine is remote. Whether you are religious or not, there are so many pieces of the true cross in the Middle Ages, you could build a thousand crosses. And there's this one in a remote priory on the coast of a remote part of England. But there's nothing to say it couldn't be genuine. It could, I'm merely saying the odds are against it. But for the deeply religious minds of the 13th century, this was nothing less than sacred. Henry headed off there with his entourage, arriving on the 1st of July. And Hubert de Burr had made arrangements to head back after the visit to his manor at Burr, which was nearby, only around 10 miles. There are several towns called Burr, but this is the one at Burr and Tuttington. Could have got there in around five or six hours, including some rest time and faffing about. Four hours if they went with haste. Which is where we come to the incident. As at the manor in Burr, they were enjoying wine, no doubt after a feast, no doubt spurred on by a talk about the true cross at the old priory. Henry swears an oath on the Gospels that de Burr and his wife would enjoy the titles of office and processions for life. Basically, Hubert de Burr has the audacity, the gall, the chutzpah to put out two pre-written grants and to get Henry to sign them with his seal. One confirming the oath and the other giving de Burr the powers to prevent the king from, from ever going back on this word. Magna Carta was raising its ugly head again and de Burr was taking more control. Henry doesn't like being put on the spot. He prefers to deliberate on matters. He's more of a politician than a soldier. Still, he had his seal stamped on the grants. And once again, de Burr was happy. And then they got back to their wine and talked about the true cross. Overall, the evening went well. However, the Chancellor, Ralph Neville, was there at the event. He urges the King to reverse this, calling it irresponsible. It wasn't just the king that got letters to sign, everyone present did. One letter with a list of names swearing oaths to back the king's choice. Oh, but Neville scratched his off the list. He wanted no part of this. Henry was losing popularity, but all that was about to reverse, as last month's investigation into Robert de Dweng and the secretive universitas was still ongoing. The Dweng may have been forgiven, but there still had been a number of arrests. This included two of de Burr's cronies. And now there was real evidence that the Drusicia himself was linked to Universitas, and thus funding banditry. Or at least that's the allegation. The king had to make the only logical choice. Uh, no doubt the words of Neville, de Blondeville and de Roche in his ear. It was becoming increasingly clear that Hubert de Burr knew the game was up and thus pressured the king to sign the oath, uh, probably hoping it would block punishment. Unfortunately for de Burr, 
and the walls were closing in. Simply put, de Burr was a power-hungry liability. Uh, Henry would have to break the oaths he put his seal to. Almost nothing is written about what happens next, and we only have snippets from later conversations regarding the event. People recalled here and there bits of what happened, but we can piece it together. Later in July, the court was moved to Woodstock, Oxfordshire, and by the 29th of July, Hubert de Burr was sacked as the Jutisia of England. It was a nasty affair. There were massive arguments. Oaths were shouted in insult. Apparently, de Burr even tried to charge the king with a knife intent on killing him. The two apparently actually grappled with the younger Henry fending off the older de Burr. Similar to when the king rushed the Dizizia with his sword, it took attendance to drag de Burr off. These accounts are by Matthew Paris, who's a bit of a, a drama queen and prone to exaggeration, but even so. For de Burr, the mask was dropped. He was exposed and he was out, banished from court. But not the realm, as the king wanted de Burr to be held accountable for his crimes, especially for the discrepancies in the treasury, because this is what he had access to. If Henry wanted to defeat de Burr, he was going to do it properly. Henry suspected there were some expenditures, anomalies, and money wasted in negligence, or worse, that weren't accounted for. He had 17 castles and over 100 properties acquired over the years and were earning him a good penny. An investigation was needed. The former Jusicia uh, tries to produce a charter sealed by King John from decades past uh, that gave him immunity from all of this. Uh, but Peter de Roche has seen that one coming and wasn't going to let de Burr slip away on a technicality. Uh, this charter was between him and King John. What happened with John died with John. Uh, the bugger was, Henry had put his seal into supporting the Charter, and among other things. Furthermore, Magna Carta prevented Henry from simply scrapping a Charter he didn't like. This would require approval. And for once, the Grumblers, led by Ranulf de Blondeville, would prove useful, as they were more than willing to lend their support to ridding any charters connected with de Burr. His enemies also alleged that de Burr was sabotaging the king's marriages. He apparently conspired with the Welsh to hang William de Broas, the younger. And this is when we first hear of these allegations that he poisoned William Longsby and William the Younger Marshal. Uh, there was also the reminder of his crimes against the Londoners uh, during the riots that happened a few years ago. A rotter! A dastardly villain! Henry wanted him to address some of these despicable crimes, well, the, the sensible ones anyway, and summon him to appear at a council in Lambeth, his neck of the woods, in September that year. However, de Burr had fled to Merton, Surrey, in the wake of some other terrible allegations, from murder to witchcraft. He's even accusing of stealing a magic stone from the treasury that people believed would have granted him a talisman in battle, and he'd handed it to Llewellyn. No wonder the Welsh were strong in a fight. It was the talisman. About the only thing he wasn't accused of was cattle rustling. Hubert had no choice but to flee. De Burr had reached ambitious, 
dizzy heights. But like Icarus, he had flown too close to the sun. Now he came tumbling back down to earth, his career in ruins. As far as the king was concerned, De Boer was frankly taking the what's it. Appealing to Henry's pious nature by seeking sanctuary was not a good move. And when the king receives a letter from De Boer explaining that he won't appear to the summoners due to fear, the king's not happy. In De Boer's defence, some of these allegations came with some of the worst punishments of the medieval era. And de Boer is not young. He's from the era of Henry II, Richard the Lionheart and King John. In his day, things like treason can get him hung, drawn and quartered. But still punishments are going around now. Hence he's, no doubt, trying to appeal to the king's good nature. Despite the villain he was, he was no evil monster. Surely the king can see this. As far as Henry was concerned, de Boer had forced his hand and he created a search party to find him. Powers were given to Andrew Buckerell, the mayor of London, to bring de Boer before the king, alive or dead. The manhunt was underway for the fallen magnate 20,000 people, yes, 20,000 people, a large mob, was now heading towards Merton. There was nowhere in the London area for de Boer to hide, as the baying mob closed in on him like a fox in a hunt. Even Ranoff de Blondeville, his enemy, was shocked at this manhunt. He urged Henry to call it off. The Chancellor, Ralph Neville, agreed to this. So a rider was dispatched with orders for the mob to disperse, which they did, and in a confuted state, returned to London. De Boer still didn't adhere to the summons, though. Instead, he heads to Bury St Edmunds to see his wife, Margaret, who incidentally is also Princess Margaret of Scotland, sister to Alexander II. In case you're wondering why she hasn't been arrested and hounded as bait, uh, the king couldn't afford provoking the Scottish here. <laughs> and from here, de Boer again goes on the run, pressing on to Norwich, seeking out Thomas Blunville, the bishop there, no doubt looking for guidance in these troubled times. After all, he's got good connections with Norwich, as the previous bishop there was Panov Vraccio, who had died some years back. Unfortunately, Henry doesn't see it like that. All he sees is de Boer heading north via his wife and fears that he is fleeing to Scotland to the protection of his brother-in-law, Alexander II. The King's steward, Geoffrey of Crowcombe, is given a contingent of the King's Meunier, the household guards, to bring de Boer in and sling him in the Tower of London. Godfrey is a friend of de Boer, and the two trusted each other, which was probably why the steward was chosen in the first place, to ease de Boer's fears. Uh, but de Boer rabbited once again, uh, this time to a chapel in Brentwood, Essex, again seeking sanctuary. Uh, this time the rabbit was easy to catch, and Godfrey, with his posse of knights, found poor Hubert de Burr on his knees, praying at the altar of the chapel. He was arrested, dragged out, Godfrey urging him to come quietly, either he comes or his head does. Henry apparently waited up all night, uh, waiting for news that de Burr was imprisoned in the tower. Now, Roger Niger, the chap we met, uh, when St Paul's, was struck by lightning that time, well, as the Bishop of London, he's not impressed by sanctuary being broken and protests to the King. Now, get this, the King agrees with Roger. 
So, Godfrey of Crocum is ordered to take De Burr out of the tower and back up to Brentwood to complete his sanctuary. You can't make it up. Although, to stop the rabbit escaping once again, a cordon of knights was stationed around the church as <laughs> encouragement to hand himself over. Henry restricted De Burr's rations to only half a loaf of bread and one large beer a day. All his assets and property were seized. This must, by the way, have given the locals something to talk about, some good bit of gossip, uh, given that this was a world without social media and photography. Uh, most of the locals probably didn't even know this man in the chapel or who he was. He's no doubt rich, given by his clothing and the way he acts. And something important was certainly going on. He's probably got quite the crowd. De Burr could only watch as his estates were stripped and his castles confiscated. He was also stripped of the position of Justicia. The 17 years of service in the position were undone. Stephen Seagrave was made the new Justicia, and it wasn't like he had no experience. As in 1230, when de Burr was fighting in France, it was Seagrave who kept the seat warm. And he wasn't some stuffy old man from the days of King John. He was young, a part of this new wave of nobility rising up through the ranks. He was also the protégé of the Blondeville. As for the estates, uh, they were placed under the care of Peter de Raviles, also known to history as Peter of Revu, uh, which must have aggravated de Burr, as this young clerk was rumoured to be the son of Peter de Roche, or at least his nephew. And Peter de Roche was already putting his own plans into action. Where de Burr had failed, and de Roche managed to secure uh, the 40th on movables in tax revenue. About £17,000 raised. Uh, the Bishop of Winchester was making subtle changes here and there, giving out titles and sheriffdoms, handing them to people like Revue. Uh, going back to de Burr, he's still in a lot of trouble. Uh, thankfully, uh, Henry would deal with this in a civil manner, ignoring the more outrageous allegations. Uh, he concentrates on the treasury and the exchequer. But the investigation wouldn't just cover Henry's reign, but that of King John. Henry wanted to know if the figures added up. Had de Burr been fiddling the books? Oh, boy! It turns out that in Lambeth, London, the wily old scallywag had amassed quite the treasure hoard. So in September, Henry also had a separate council in London Lambeth, a de Burr's personal manor. He obtains the grant to move household goods. He's basically acting like the Inland Revenue or the IRS. And then, in October, oh, there was some bad news, as Ranulf de Blondeville fell ill at the age of just 60, and then passed from this world soon after, uh, the last relic of the old feudal aristocracy. In his time, he passed into legend. He was equally as famous as Robin Hood. There were po poems and songs about him, though none survive to this day. He was known kingdom-wide for putting it to Hubert de Burr. Blondeville was the ultimate rebel with a cause. And it seems poetic that no sooner had justice been served to the villain. De Blondeville's work was complete. And then he ascended the stairs to meet the saints. And was buried to much mourning. And now, Richard Marshall 
of the second son of an old legend took the leadership of the Barons. Mm -hmm.